His first book of poetry is What You Can't Have that came out with signature editions. Please, a warm round of applause for Michael B. Smith. Is that little X for where we're supposed to stand? Is that why that's there? Oh my God, I love it. Hi everybody, I'm Michael B. Smith. Thank you for coming. I am now the gayest man in Montreal. Um, I'm going to read a variety of things. I've been trying to read uh, things that I have... Um, I'm trying to read every poem in the book before the end of this little set of tour. Um, and so I had to pick very wisely what poems I wasn't going to read in my hometown. So I'm going to read some of the poems that I decided weren't good for anywhere that family was going to be. And I, there's no family that's going to be here. That's not my family that walked in the door now, is it? No. Yay! Hi! Okay, so I'm going to read a variety of things that hopefully my family won't see online either. Or I'll have a lot of explaining to do. This is called Surrogate. And when I grew up, and my arms were still the two sticks of a boy, my ribs as sharp as ever, when my body failed to meet my expectations like dreams that offer more than the day delivers, I chose other men to comfort me. Each one fit mouth, ass, hands, the places where need, salty need, makes pride a thing you swallow. And this is uh, called Salvation. I read this at uh, the Vancouver International Film Festival, and then they saw this and decided to make me one of Vancouver's most dangerous people, which is very <laughs> exciting. I don't carry a gun, but all the same. Um, so this is Salvation, and I don't think it's that dangerous, really. If I stood at my open window with a strange new light falling gold over my skin, now smooth and pale like cream, no clothes, with breasts grown full as love and my cock inverted to a tight vagina, if my hair grew back full from the forehead up and fell out from there on down, if I were a Venus in the window, all curves, I'd share everything. I'd masturbate for the men heading home, the two tired men of little hope, the hard workers with unhappy jobs. They would see me and cluster on the sidewalk, eyes dewy, hats in hand, a lump in their throats and pants, until someone brave enough would climb the stairs and find my door ajar, and me pleased to please. He would have me on the windowsill until he was satisfied, and each man from the street, each deserving man, would approach for a taste of this transformation. So by dawn, I'd be raw, and then by evening, ready and healed. That's too much for family. <laughs> they don't want to know those things. Um, May 10th was uh, three of my friends' birthdays, which is not relevant, and, um, and also the eighth anniversary of my not drinking. And uh, in honor of May 10th, which is um, a very nice day to celebrate a birthday, I thought I would read this poem here because I've been waiting to read it somewhere that family wasn't going to be. Um, this is called The Sad Truth, and this is my last night of drinking. Not that any of these poems have any relevance to reality. These are all <laughs> fictitious. The Sad Truth. You will only have one drink. Friends are here toasting your buddy's sculpture of a worn shoe, Xerox gray, thick and nearly two-dimensional, which everyone agrees is strikingly simple, common yet complex making you feel you are nothing out of the ordinary, but special nonetheless. After the first drink, a second can't hurt. The beer is cheap. You order a third. When your body begins a real good buzz, your date taps you on the shoulder. Time to leave. 
Across town, you attend another get-together far more important than this one. The wine is free. You fill up on this opportunity, working the crowd of film people, which is your thing, or which you hope to be your thing, except here's the disappointing part. Here's what nudges the evening towards disaster, like a small wind helping a traveler choose the wrong fork in the road. You felt better where you came from than where you ended up. You cruise whatever cute men happen to fall into your line of vision until who knows how long later, your pal again persuades you to leave. Outside, the spring ocean air is, is uh, gorgeous in your lungs, like dozens of microscopic fingers pinching you awake. Sure, you're drunk. You don't remember the last hour of the party, but now you're headed home, walking through the pooling streetlights on a night all moon and no stars. You need to pee. You excuse yourself to lurch behind a building and prop one shoulder against a pine. You black out only long enough to find your hand warm, and what you have to admit is gooey down the back of your pants. A bad dream. You've shit yourself and have checked to make sure you did, in fact, shit yourself. <laughs> You wish you could wake up night over, only you aren't asleep, and your hand has a very real problem. You remove your shoes, jeans, and underwear, but not your socks. You don't want to get your feet dirty. Beneath you, the ground is covered with wood chips, and the fallen pine needles are softer than you expected when you scoop them up. You wipe your hand, then your ass. There is comfort knowing that this isn't so different, really, from what it's like to crap in the woods. You could be camping. When, when you're as clean as you can be, you abandon the Calvin Kleins that were a gift anyway, pull on your pants, and then scan for your shoes, which you now realize you shouldn't have tossed out of the way without noting in which direction you toss them. Again, your body ties a heavy black blindfold round your mind. You come to. You aren't at home. You're in the park with your hands parting the cheeks of an ass spreading disease while two feet away, some guy pulls at himself just out of reach with a look that says he costs more than you're worth. You lurch to the curb where the old guy with the big rings you've seen down here before offers you a ride in his black Mercedes. The slow drive home, he doesn't touch you even once, which you hope is more about respect than with how you smell. Only in the morning do you remember the friend you left on the street corner waiting for you to pee. Did he walk around the side of the building and catch you with your pants down, or did he abandon you as you so often feared he would? Only this time, that would be a blessing. Yeah, those were the days. Man, I miss it. <laughs> um, and then I thought I would read some sweet poems, because I don't want people to think I'm sick and only sick. So I'm going to read some, sick po some sweet poems. <laughs> um, a third of the book, uh, a third of the book is called Photographs. It's the middle section. And um, when I was in San Francisco a few, quite a few years ago, in 2001, I saw this exhibit that was uh, photographs taken by William Gale Gedney about uh, in the 60s and 70s in Kentucky, in very rural Kentucky with these exceptionally poor families. They had dirt, dirt floors in their houses. And he lived with them and uh, took photographs of them. And I really liked them. And, and I thought it was very interesting that he took these lives and translated them into this work, and so I wrote these poems, which I say are translations of Gedney's work into something else. So it's that sort of, that sort of mutation. Um, and there's a quote that I got out of one of Gedney's journals. He kept a lot of journals, and you can find copies of them online. And this is a quote by Italo Calvino from Invisible Cities that William, William Gale Gedney had in his book. Elsewhere is a negative mirror. The traveler recognizes the little that is his, discovering the much he has not had and will never have. And I'm just going to read a couple from, the, from that section. This is called Lonely. 
Their mother sits on the porch so close to their dad in his armchair. He feels the night shift each time she swings her hair, tying blue ribbons at the back. The middle sister, sister three of five, she calls herself, helps make two bows. The air tastes of cool, damp grass. The sun has abandoned the yard. The children want to stand here barefoot on the floorboards, relaxed, all their skin relaxed, open to the sounds of the woods. They each would like to be the one who asks the question which keeps their parents home tonight their father talking the sun back over the trees. And this is intellect. She is the dark child who refuses to wash, who wears the same dress worn through, her hair pulled back days later only because her mother pins it better than she cares. She eats what she can carry to the woods, sleeps next to the open window when she's home. One night, her mother woke to her shadow beyond the door frame, walking away, her daughter, the girl with ideas. And then I've been closing with the same two poems because they're my two favorite poems in the book. One's depressing and one is happy, so let's just live through this. <laughs> um, this is called Answer the Dark. So these are my last two poems. Now's a really good time to take a picture. I'm in a good moment. <laughs> Answer the dark. Love is hiding in the shadows of his body, his mouth the shape of my need, and his hands an invitation. Why won't the man let me find him out? His bedroom door closed when I visit, his buttons all done up save one. I love too much what he can't give me and what little I can get, what peace. Does he too sit in the dark of himself and ask why he can't clear the way to his heart? Or am I alone? How often do the fears I eclipse inside myself have me venture forward through diseases of lovers long past, wade naked into pools of blood turned against itself, or descend into the knowledge I will live too long, with little company. How can I convince you? It is not the darkness we can't face, but what it holds. Not light that breaks, but the bulb. Not love that fails, but the heart and its capacity. And um, this is my last poem. And a friend of mine, Matt Rader, who is a very dear friend, uh, we run a reading series together, and he's mostly responsible for how this book came to be, so I dedicated the book to him. Um, I have two jokes about the book. Uh, Matt's this straight boy, and uh, the book's called What You Can't Have, so I said that I dedicated it to him. And the second joke, that's not my best one. The second joke <laughs> is that it's called What You Can't Have, but for $15 you can. That's my, that's my better joke. So I have two jokes. Anyway, so Matt's this guy. He's got a baby. He had a baby last um, November. Her name's Neela Emiliana Rader. And because he's a poet, he and he has poet friends. He invited all of his close poet friends who might be interested to write poems for his daughter on her birth. And so a whole bunch of us did. Liz wrote a poem, and Nick Thran wrote a poem, and all these people wrote poems. I luckily have had the first one published because I like to get things done. Um, <laughs> And so this is a poem for Neil Emiliana Rader, who was born in November 2005, and it's called Childproofing, and it's the last poem in the book. What could we undo? Say we take away famine, boys bleeding in the streets, the bullets fly back into their guns. If we could refasten the cells of skin and cartilage that make the tender wound, each of us furled into the wombs of our mothers, and our mothers drawn back, and then again, generations unborn to quiet the hungry belly. What would we have to offer when the tape was all rewound? There is no sun without its shadow, no living without consequence. Let us make the future so unlike its past, we can forget the names of tragic things. Neela, 
three weeks new and not a stitch of language. You're this, our science fiction. Your tongue too light for words, two hands, smaller than the Martian bugs of Mexico. Thank you very much.